Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, 25 to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God. About two weeks ago, a number of people in our congregation got emails or text messages that appeared to come from me or Tim asking for a quick response, but Tim nor I sent those emails. They were scam emails. This actually happens somewhat frequently. Every few months, people in the church uh, report to me that they've received an email. And uh, this has been going on for years. So 15 or 20 years ago, it was painfully obvious that the email did not come from me. Now, it, it's harder to tell. It comes with our branding. It comes with a photo of me, an email account that has my name on it. And so it's a little bit harder to figure out what's going on. Now, we know what's going on because we used to have a member of the church whose favorite thing in life was to get these emails. Uh, and I don't know um, what his annual performance review at work was, but in the middle of the workday, if he got an email saying it was from me, him knowing it was not from me, would devote the next hour to engaging the person. And so uh, I remember one time, uh, the person he was uh, going back and forth was, was insisting that he send iTunes gift cards. Uh, and the story, uh, when, he, when he responded, because the email usually comes like, hey, there's an urgent matter, please get back to me. Okay, what's the matter? And uh, I'm at the hospital, I'm visiting one of our members, could you please send iTunes gift cards? So there's a lot you could work with there. So there was the, well, you know, uh, I'd be happy to come by and bring a meal, not sure why should we should bring iTunes gift cards. Well, the person really is discouraged and wants to praise the Lord and some, some good music would be really good. And then he might reply something back like actually even better than iTunes gift cards. I'll just give him my Spotify login and he could have access to everything the whole time. And they would go back and forth where he would just keep making it difficult for the next step to move forward and completely exasperate the person. As far as I know, he won every time that uh, the person eventually just gave up. So I don't know the outcome of how these scams actually work, but I know that usually there's some sort of financial desire. And so it's a modern example of an ancient problem. Human beings always have the instinct to take what doesn't belong to them. So in the Ten Commandments, one of them is do not steal. But cultures throughout the ages and other places without these commandments can intuit that theft is not good for society. Uh, and yet we always do it. And so uh, in the modern age, theft now goes to identity uh, and it goes to whatever units of some currency you have stored somewhere that you've never actually seen or held. And so theft may look and feel a little bit differently, um, but it's still an issue. We're in a portion of the Bible in the book of Ephesians where each week we're looking at specific examples of the greater teaching that we're being urged to join our lives with Jesus and to live so fully within that life, within that system as a coherent way of life, that we put aside the old way, the normal way, the way that anybody might naturally function with its corruptions and problems, and take on this new life that promises to be 
fruitful. Um, and so today we're focusing on verse 28. So we're kind of going slowly through this section. Uh, and in verse 28, it says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Uh, so just in walking through this verse, I'm gonna talk about stealing, laboring, and sharing. Because um, this is just another example that's given to us in this portion of the way that transformation can work. We have um, ways of ha uh, habits, skills, uh, things that we're doing. Uh, now we need to redirect them. We need to be reformed, reoriented. And so the thief may have devoted a lot of time and energy into developing skills in that area. Well, take those skills and reapply them, live differently for a different purpose. And so the, the sermon series is called Join Together, Growing Together. One of the things that links all the specific topics that we're looking at is uh, each of the former behaviors separates us, alienates us, breaks community down, uh, ruins our own well-being. But when, we, when we're called into this new way of life, it's a way of life that brings flourishing. And so once we're joined together, not only do, how do we maintain it, well, don't steal, but how do we grow together. Well, let's share what we have. And so we're going to look at those three things. And I'm going to begin with stealing, just because that's the, uh, the initial charge. Let the thief no longer steal. So uh, I don't know how many of you are immediately convicted by that. If you shoplifted this week, for example, you might think, okay, the Lord has brought me here to expose my sin. Um, but I think it's, all, it's easy for a lot of us to think, well, this is probably not a primary area, but, but what is it at the heart of theft? It's, it's that self-serving instinct that is underlying so, many, so much of our wrongdoing that orients us to take rather than to give. And I think most of us would say, yeah, there's at least some instinct or some example or some time where that's, that's what I want. I want to take what I can, even if I overstep a boundary of fairness or whether or not it belongs to me. In um, uh, one portion of crime theory, there's something they call the fraud triangle and trying to figure out what is it that leads to um, fraud. And, and the triangle involves three elements of um, pressure, opportunity, and rationalization, that those three work together uh, to typically have somebody step into a fraudulent behavior, but also to become a way of life. So pressure, what kind of pressure causes somebody to step into fraud? And the obvious one we would think of is probably financial pressure, and that's true. And so, so the, uh, the simple example of theft that often comes to mind is somebody who's starving who goes to a grocery store and shoplifts. It's an example where I think most of us would be sympathetic to say, even though they shouldn't have done that, it's understandable. There's a certain sympathy there. Part of answering that is to say, well, what kind of society can we shape so that somebody who's starving doesn't have to steal. But, but as you move forward with other dynamics, uh, even financial need, financial need is not also always uh, basic necessity, but when you live in a prosperous society, sometimes our covetousness, our greed, has us see others who have it financially better than us, and therefore there's a temptation, the, the pressure, I want more and I don't have, and so that becomes a temptation to steal. But it's interesting when you start to reflect on, on the various motivations that are out there, something like shoplifting, um, there's a phenomenon where some do it for the thrill. They do it simply because uh, it's almost like a, a, a dopamine regulation. They get bored and there's something exciting and enticing about the risk of doing it. So without any actual need, um, the need is experiential. If you can go in and take something uh, and the, the, the rush of the risk and the sense of accomplishment that you pulled it off, oddly enough, that's enough to motivate some people to that behavior. So when we talk about pressures, uh, there are very basic pressures which are very understandable, but there's actually deeper, more complex pressures at work in us with our selfishness, our imperfections, and then therefore the temptation to steal, uh, we're all prone to it. So the pressure is one of these legs, but the opportunity is another. And so maybe three years ago, when it was clear that word on the street was, 
uh, police are not going to prosecute you. They're not going to arrest you if you shoplift. Maybe that encouraged a, a greater freedom of, of a lower risk. But some of you in your workplace um, may be looking through financial reports and realizing with thousands of dollars going back and forth at high rate, nobody's going to miss 50 bucks. And uh, two or three times a week, an extra $150 cash. And of course, you're committed to a good and just society, so you'll pay tax on that. Uh, and, and then actually you realize you, you want to pay tax because you're for the good of all, but, but paying tax would show that you actually uh, can't account for how you got that money. So now you have a moral quandary of how did you steal from the corporation, but can't claim that. And then so we get ourselves in these little, uh, these little uh, areas where we're stuck because we see an opportunity that we take. And then that opportunity creates the need for rationalization. We're moral beings by nature. And so some people don't have so much of a sharpened conscience that just the, the questions of right or wrong don't affect them so much, but most people do. And therefore, in order to, to overstep that kind of line, uh, there needs to be a rationalization of, of why it seemed an appropriate behavior. And that's actually where we get into trouble because then you need to distort the truth. You need to have a, a looser view of reality that not only shapes us in relation to that one action, but, uh, but starts to shape how we relate to others. And so what happens in society where we're not being truthful because we all have self-serving desires where we want to take and we're not being forthright about it. And so we're having conversations where we're not really talking to each other and connecting because of that rationalization. If you take uh, uh, examples of how crime progresses with like something like organized crime, uh, there's a number of rackets that mobsters have been in over the years, but, uh, but hijacking is always, always a good one because if you could steal one truckload of merchandise, a whole truck, you're really getting away with a lot more than you could fill in your pockets with a shoplifting scam. And so uh, mobsters, not necessarily known as having the the strongest conscience around, and, and some certainly uh, you, 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 you exist in a criminal uh, organization where violence is part of it. At some point, business is just business, and if you have to kill your brother, you don't feel bad about it. But it's interesting, even in a context like that, there's that moral impulse. And so uh, one thing that was common with hijacking in the 70s in Brooklyn was if, uh, if they would, however they would get the truck to pull over, they would have to intimidate the truck driver enough uh, to know to not resist, to not report it. They would tie up the truck driver, but occasionally you'd hear a story where they would stick a $20 bill in the truck driver's pocket. Uh, the idea being, hey, look, you're just a working guy. This is not about you. But we want this stuff from the company and we have to do this and we're sorry about it. And so here's some kind of repayment. It's, it's an interesting sign that there's an awareness that there's something with the conscience to say, what we're doing here is at least wrong to somebody. And we want to make that right. And then the language of how sales in Brooklyn went where things fell off the truck. Uh, the idea of the, the, the moral person who's for the working class. These are items that the people in this neighborhood would have to pay 30% more for. We are selling it below what the store would even have it on sale. And so there's a Robin Hood mindset to say that this hijacking thing we're into is really good for the people for whom it matters. And we all have the ability to do that, to, to reform uh, a story around the thing we desire and do. And so uh, this uh, lesson about theft is relevant to all of us. Maybe it's not your primary struggle, but all of us grapple with our selfishness, our willingness to do what goes against our conscience, the, the rationalizing that distorts things. And so maybe some of you are shoplifting. I hope today you uh, go back to the store and pay your tab if you could uh, figure out how much you've taken. Talk to our Mercy team if you need financial help with that. Um, but think about the news in, in recent years, uh, to the last few months, I'll we'll talk about plagiarism. plagiarism. Uh, intellectual property, is it okay to take somebody's ideas and claim them as your own? Um, and there's a bit of a fuzziness of, of, well, okay, this wasn't Chicago Manual of Style and I wasn't trying to plagiarize, but here are some ideas that I, I uh, seem to give the appearance that they came from me. Uh, if you were somebody who has 
worked within a system where you made great sacrifices for the payoffs, for the recognition, and served a supervisor who took credit for the work you did and received the bonus and the promotion, you know that uh, this is actually not good. This, is, this does not cr create a healthy environment where people are um, overstepping the boundaries of what's appropriate, taking what doesn't belong to them. So in this passage, there is that basic uh, encouragement that stealing is not a way of life. We're called out of that. So secondly, we're called into laboring. Now the phrase here, it says, uh, rather let the, the former thief labor, doing honest work with his own hands. So honest work uh, is the contrast to the dishonest thieving. But I'm using the language of laboring because when, when, when the passage says, let the, the former thief labor, honest work, that's the encouragement, go and do that. Uh, but that's actually somewhat simple. The word labor in the Bible, sometimes uh, there are similar words like toil, implies that the work isn't easy. <laughs> um, there's something about work that's hard and we're encouraged um, to do work that can be hard and to endure periods of frustration and not to give in to the easier way to compromise. Um, and so in the, in the Bible work in the very beginning, God, we meet God as a worker in a sense that Genesis one is a recounting of the work of creation where God uh, shows his authority, his wisdom and power to order chaos and to call into being things which are not and, and to create a context where then humanity is called to be imitators of God in the same way that God worked in six days and rested on one. So now that's the perpetual pattern for humanity that we are to go into the world and to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth. And so things are disordered, things are chaotic, and everybody has the opportunity in some sphere or some area to gain skill and ability and to take time and energy and to order things so that there's a fruitfulness, so that the end result is a flourishing. Uh, but then uh, where the opening two chapters give a vision and a trajectory of what can be, the third chapter of the Bible is the famous story of Adam and Eve and the serpent where they turn from God. And in that betrayal where, where they bring chaos back into the order of the world, um, we find that God announces the reality that, that now this life that you've chosen is cursed. And so to Adam, he says, by the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread. There's a curse on our work. And to Eve, he says, now with childbearing, it will be painful. Interesting, we still use the word labor for that glorious but painful and risky moment, a productive moment, but a moment that is awfully costly. And that's now the nature of work in whatever form, not just employment, but anything that you're interested in doing, where you want to advance, you want to order, you want to gain skill, you want there to be flourishing. It's now hard, it's discouraging. Things don't work and so there's injustice, there's disaster. You could put a lot of time and energy into something that will never be realized. Or you could be working honestly and you have competitors who are not and so it's unfair. Or you just run out of steam or you realize that you've been devoting yourself to something that you don't have sufficient competency in. There's so many ways that our work becomes painful, frustrating, and yet there's still something good about it. The world could be better. We could learn, we could serve, we could use our time and energy and skills for flourishing. And yet that internal pressure is always there. It's hard, it's discouraging. Isn't there an easier way? And the easier way tempts us to find a way that maybe we're not forthright about, maybe we're not honest about it. Look, yeah, there's Occam's razor and not just for ideas, but if there's a simple way to do something, do it simple, but if there's a, way that is not good, if you, could, if you could build without the inspector knowing what's behind the wall, even if the, bill, if, if the building is not as safe, that's not good. And so there's that internal pressure because labor is hard. The problem is it's easy to get stuck in this triangle where the pressure leads us to some kind of compromise because opportunities avail themselves. When, when you're feeling the pressure, you see them more often, rather than seeing, here's the end result of what, what I wanna give myself to, but here's the current difficulty I wanna get myself out of, then the opportunities are there. And then the question is, will we take them? Well, little by little we do, and we, ra we rationalize it until we sink down more deeply. 
um, there's a sense in which there's, the Bible pictures a certain hopelessness to humanity because of that pressure. No matter how good your intentions are, no matter how much you try, there's always going to be some moment of despair, of wanting to give up, of wanting to compromise. And, and that's where Jesus is presented in the Bible, not as God 2.0, you know, the story of Genesis now being updated, but actually uh, the one who did the work of creation coming to do a new kind of work, the work of redemption. The work of creation seems so glorious and effortless that he just says, let there be light, and there is, and it's good. But now God has to do something among humanity, fallen humanity, humanity with the pressures of our sin and our foolishness, where Jesus comes into the world to do a work, but it's not creation, because God has already created, but it's new creation. It's redeeming. It's coming into a world where things are frustrating, where things are unethical. And Jesus comes under the law, lives righteously by the law, uh, and yet dies under the law. Uh, he's, he's a picture of what happens when, when somebody comes and speaks the truth and does things honestly that the corrupt respond um, by hating, by killing. But the interesting thing is, in taking Jesus's life, because that's the, the language we use, a euphemism for murder, uh, they took his life. They didn't actually take his life. It, it, they took it in the sense that they took it from him. But they didn't take it in that they received anything from him. So there he is, the one who says, uh, I'm the son of God, believe in me and you will have eternal life. And they crucify him. And then they're casting lots for his clothing. Where Jesus says, you know, the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to rest his head. There's nothing of earthly value that I'm offering to you. And yet you're going to crucify me so you can take my clothes. We could take the things that we think of that give life. But in taking life from Jesus, we don't receive life. Jesus comes and says, I've come to give you life. Uh, that's the only way to get what is truly life. And, and it's our misunderstanding of what actually constitutes life that makes us run after the things that make us feel like we have life, like if we could steal possessions, or if we could pad our resume, or if we could get people to be impressed with us. We think if we have those things, we will build a life, we will create life, we will find life. And what we find is even if we're able to do those admirably and ethically, they don't satisfy our souls. And they certainly don't. Because if you could fool everyone, you can't fool yourself. Your rationalization can only go so far. And so we're called to a better way that Jesus comes and says, I will give you what is truly life. And what he does is he enters into this world with uh, that triangle going around. He enters people with the pressures of temptation and sin, uh, and he offers an opportunity, a way out. Uh, but the way out comes through his being the one who uh, suffers on our behalf, who <clears throat> receives the penalties of wrongdoing so that now things are opened up. There's an alternative. Uh, we can't take life from him, but if we look to him, we can receive life from him. And, and Ephesians is trying to call us out of an old pattern we're stuck in to a new way of life that we can live in. Uh, Jesus, in several places in the Gospels, talks about his coming to do work. And he says, my food, my bread, my meat is to do the will of the Father. And we know that he suffered the kinds of pressures we have of recognizing the very work he was called to was costly. And so on the night he was betrayed, he's in a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Luke, in Luke 22, describes him praying with such intensity of knowing what he was going to face that it says he sweated uh, so much that the imagery is it's like he sweated drops of blood. And so there he is uh, coming to do the labor of redemption. And he goes to the cross, and John records him crying out uh, in his last breath, it's finished. This work of new creation, he has fulfilled it for us. So then he could come and say, now all who labor, all who are weary, those who are heavy laden, come to me, I will give you rest. And, and the picture we get in this passage is that all of this is based on the kind of thing we see in chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us. Jesus did not come to take anything from us. He came to give everything to us. And we're told if we're trying to go through life, trying to take all that we can, we're fundamentally oriented wrong. 
But if we are oriented towards Christ who came to give himself in the life that he gives us, then we will find our souls have sufficient rest that we can go back into the world with the strength of the spirit <clears throat> to do the hard, discouraging, and difficult things that will be good if we persevere in them. And so uh, there's a sense in which there's a mindset shift. Modern people, as we think about just how our minds work and what motivates us, uh, have tapped into this principle. And so you could read popular literature that invites us to go from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. The person who feels like they never have enough is set up to engage the world in a way that is discouraging, a way that is potentially compromised. But an abundance mindset, look at what I have and how do I live out of that? Uh, that's precisely what Paul is trying to say in the book of Ephesians, is if you're stuck in this pattern of saying, I, I need to seize life, I need to grasp life, I need to take life, I need to earn life, I need to achieve life, it's not life you're pursuing. He's saying life cannot be achieved, it can only be received. You cannot take it from God, but God can give it to you. And so, so step into this new way of life where there's an abundance. And once you have the life of Christ in you, now go back into the world and, and the opportunity to steal is not as compelling because you don't wanna get in, uh, caught up in a web of lies. But you realize just the simple life of facing the hard reality and being faithful, whether or not you have control of whether or not you're successful, actually over time creates the context for health, for productivity. And so you could get the short-term gains of uh, compromise, or you can do the long-term work of doing it right. And uh, the Christian mindset is you, you don't need to prove yourself to anyone. You don't need to justify your existence or your actions. You are justified uh, by grace through faith in Christ. So now how does that work its way into how you live the rest of your life? And the last thing I wanna talk about is sharing because that's a key outworking of this. So that's the third thing. We talked about uh, stealing, laboring, and now finally sharing. So verse 28, there's a so that. It would be enough to say honesty is better than dishonesty. This is a just way of life. And when you live unjustly, other people suffer. But the Christian life is more than just restraining wrong desires. It's being renewed with the right desires. And so, so our goal is not simply to get the hard work done so that at the end, we think by having achieved it, we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. But actually, verse 28 says, it is so that this person who works honestly with their hands would have something to share with anyone in need. That's the Christian paradigm, not just that uh, do what's costly so you have enough for yourself, but understand that if life has been given to you, you can take that and, and invest that and uh, keep reinvesting the dividends of it until there's true growth and that you have not just what you need, but enough to share so that your presence is for the good of others. And so uh, this, this reorientation, not simply a self-serving person who needs to take, but a person who has received um, much more than I understand, how do I live out of that reality so that I become generous? It's interesting when you look historically, um, different periods of time, but in the, in the medieval period where monasticism was growing, people wanting to, to follow Francis or Benedict or these other figures who, who were calling Christians to a radically different way of life. Communities would form, and what was typical for many of them, each had their own values, but usually there was a renouncing of possessions. We're gonna come in and we're gonna devote ourselves to some kind of impoverished life. We're gonna devote ourselves to prayer, and then we need to do the kind of work to sustain ourselves. And so we're not starting a business, we're starting a worship community, but uh, we're going to start a farm because we need to eat. And we're gonna farm not just to eat for ourselves, but to make sure that if there are poor neighbors, we could feed them as well. Now, the historian will recognize there's complicated work here, but 100 or 200 years later, who owned all the land in the area? And it was typically the people at the monastery. So yeah, maybe some of that could be problematic, but the basic thread of we're just gonna work hard and we're not gonna to try to take advantage of anything and we're gonna give over time, 
kept again and again leading to prosperity. Uh, today, the economy is different. Owning land, farming is not as essential. Where do you see elements of that? If you were to Google what is the best beer in the world, okay, that's an aesthetic decision. Nobody's arguing that it comes from Milwaukee anymore, uh, but some would argue that it comes from Trappist monks in Belgium. There's one particular beer that you cannot buy in a store because they're not trying to become a beer company. They started making beer because that's what they had done in Belgium for many years, Belgium, and, uh, and just aficionados think that this one particular beer is the best. And so what's interesting in a modern context, they now needed to get internet savvy where they only make as much as they need. And so they don't sell it in stores, they sell it there. And you need to make an appointment and they will check your license plate and your phone number. Why? Because people want to go and buy 40 cases so they could create a black market on the internet and sell it internationally for a profit. And they're saying, we're just making the beer and this is, this is a fair price. And if you've been buying it every month for the last three months, we're gonna cut you off. <laughs> Buy a case of beer, send your friends. Um, but it's this interesting thing that here they are trying to, they simply made a product that's so desirable that people want it, that they're now realizing that others are gonna try to profit off what we're doing and that's not what we're about. And so they've kept the price the same and people, are go, you know, people will go on vacation to sort of get online and, uh, you know, so, you know, you've got your person who, uh, okay, it's easy to drive from maybe France or Poland or, or, you know, Germany or something like that, but you'll, you'll get your Portuguese that say, well, the port is nice after dinner, but with dinner, let's have a nice Trappist uh, beer, and they will drive all the way up and get their case of beer. If you go to the website, I'm not here to advertise beer, so I won't <laughs> say who they are, but on the website, uh, they're sort of, they're, tagline is we brew to live we do not live to brew um, kind of an interesting statement to make there's no problem if, if you're a hobbyist and you love your hobby i live to ride a bicycle in new york we wouldn't ride a harley davidson of course that would be dangerous uh, whatever it is that you live to do it's, it's appropriate to to be so passionate about something that you would say i live to do this but here's an alternate community, say we, we live to draw near to God. And in order to sustain that life, we brew. And as it turns out, we brew better than you or your friends. Uh, but here it is, we don't live to brew, but brewing is what we're doing because God has given us wisdom and skill and we're applying it. And in this case, God's blessed us with the right recipe and so we're gonna keep making it because that allows us to maintain uh, this life of prayer and devotion. Um, the Protestants have a number of reasons why we don't um, uh, fully go into the monastic life. We are to go out into the world, um, but in what ways can we as a church be that community that, that gathers here, not because this is a great community for social networking, that you meet other successful people here, or that you can get funders for a business, but it's just a gathering of people who are drawing near to God to grow and to encourage one another, and then to go back into the world and devote a lot of hours during the week to work, to hard work. Um, how could we encourage it to be honest work? Uh, that there's something about the way that we go back into the world, which try to do it this week, and you realize even a company with a strong legal department, great rules, remaining somebody that does honest work, no matter where you're doing your work, is gonna be challenging. And so what does it look like for there to be a, a movement of people that say we actually are not living to achieve, to work for the reputation, for the bonus. We are living because God has given us life. And now we're going out into the world and if, if our work prospers and we get a bonus, wonderful. I'm gonna feel satisfied in it. And then I'm gonna recognize I have something to share with any who have need. And then the complicated question, how do you do that? Um, because of the way that our economies work, we tend to prosper financially, so we help people with need financially. And so the natural thing is find an organization that supports people with needs and help fund them. That's a great thing to do. 
But it's also helpful to get outside of the economic mindset because for some of you, the work that you do, do is hard, it's valuable, but it doesn't pay you at all or in a lucrative way. Does that mean you have nothing to share? Well, what are the resources we have? Time is a precious resource. Not everybody could sit with somebody who's hurting and just be with them. Um, but do you have an abundance that can be shared? You probably have an abundance of something. Uh, next week, we're looking at, at the verses that talk about how people tear one another down with our words. We slander, we gossip. Do you have a generosity of spirit that you are somebody that can see what's good and encourage people in it? Um, there are many ways that we are to share with people in need. It's part of a whole way of life. The, it, this week, it, there's not a, a quick principle to say, don't do this, do that. But it's a, it's a shift from a way of life that's self-serving, where I, I take what doesn't belong to me to a life that says I received what I didn't earn. And yet there's an abundance that's possible if I go back into the world to share from what Jesus did to me. Uh, that certainly will make my life better. What could it do to the people around me? And let's be the kind of church that's trying to keep laboring to do that hard work for our sake, but for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of our city, and certainly to be mindful of anyone who has need. Let me pray for us. Our Father, <clears throat> um, it seems so simple, and yet doing it is often so hard. We need that abundance of grace. We need that work of Christ to uh, to make its way into every aspect of our being so that our selfishness is conquered and diminishes, so that our generosity and kindness abound, uh, so that we take um, the time and the resources and the skills and the ability and however you've made us, we find that day by day there's something to do that's good because you've given us life. And so uh, help us this week to experiment with this, to find out ways to be people who have a real deep radical generosity uh, and a faith that everything that we truly need you supply and a patience for the labor where, um, where we often feel like it's never enough or good enough. But Lord, transform us with this new mindset and help us as a church to love one another in this way, but also to love our neighbors, to love our community, to love our friends, our family, our coworkers. Uh, may there be um, a movement uh, growing in our city of generosity that gives glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.